is Jessica Van Dyke, and I am the Assistant Educational Coordinator at Carl Foundation Hospital. Um, we have a school there for cytology, um, and I am also just a practicing cytotech there as well. Um, I came straight from there, actually, hence the scrubs, so this is what I wear to work every day. Um, so my uniform, so to speak. Um, I'm here to talk to you about cytology and um, being a cytotechnologist. Um, if you guys are like where I was at this point in your life, you maybe have not even ever heard of cytology, um, what it is that we do, um, uh, you know, what the field is in general. So I'm going to kind of just give you a brief overview of the field. I'll get into a little bit more depth on things that we learn and look for. I'm not going to give you a big lecture on nucleoli or anything, but, but we'll get into a little bit of details um, just so you can see what kinds of things we're looking at. Um, and we'll talk later a little bit more about the school, about becoming a cytotechnologist, and about the opportunities that are in the field. Um, so what is it that we do? Um, cytotechnologists perform microscopic evaluations of patient samples for the purposes of diagnosing cancer, precancerous lesions, benign tumors, infectious agents, and inflammatory processes. It's kind of a big long run on sentence. It's a basic thing of we take cells, we stain them, we look at them under the scope, and we're evaluating them for any pathologic changes. The big one that we're looking for is cancer. Um, it's kind of one of the more rewarding aspects of our job is our part in the fight against cancer, um, diagnosing that so that patients can get the treatment that they need. But we're also trained to look for you know, any other pathologic change, any, an infectious process, um, you know, identifying parasites, fungi, bacteria, um, identifying um, non-malignant lesions, you know, not every tumor is malignant, so being able to, to identify those cells that are neoplastic but not malignant um, and differentiating them from malignancy, as well as there's some reactive and inflammatory processes and things like that. All right, so what do we do day to day? Uh, this is a picture here of a tech sitting at her desk with her scope. Probably 80% of my day is spent sitting at the scope. If you hate scope work, this might not be the right field for you. Um, but we're also responsible for some um, of the collection and preparation that goes into it as well. Um, the next slides that I have will talk a little more about the preparation. Um, I'm just going to take a second to talk about collection. Um, it's kind of one of the more fun things that we do as well. It's referring to what we call fine needle aspirations, which is where we actually go to the patient um, on a procedure. Um, there's a proceduralist there. It's often a radiologist or a pathologist. And right there with the patient, they take um, a fine needle, small needle, stick it in the lesion or whatever they're interested in, and, and hand you the sample. And you, right there on site, you process it. You do a quick stain, smear it. We have a, a scope that's on a cart that we wheel around the hospital. Um, and you evaluate it right there on site. And that way you're able to tell the proceduralist if there's enough material to then take it back to the lab and process it. Um, it's actually a really important kind of service that we provide. You can imagine if, um, if we weren't there to do that, the sample gets all the way back to the lab, takes it a couple days to get processed, and then there's not enough there. Now the patient has to return to the hospital, have the whole thing done again. So it saves a lot of time, it saves the patient money. Um, and it's also kind of the limit of our patient interaction that we have. Um, but it's fun to get out of the lab a couple of times a day and um, actually kind of see the face of the people that you're helping. There's not a lot of patient contact in cytotechnology, but you do see patients. This is a tech that is sitting at a hood. It should probably look familiar to you guys from lab experiences that you've had. It's basic lab stuff, vortexing, centrifuging. Um, we have some you know, automated systeming, but a lot of it gets done by hand still. All right, this tech is at one of our staining stations. She is performing a pap stain. We'll talk more about pap stains later. Uh, and again, we have automated staining as well, but some of it has to have, be done by hand. All right, I'll switch gears now and talk a little bit more about what it is that we're looking at when we're looking at the scope. Um, cytotechs are trained to evaluate any organ in the body. Cells from different organs look a little different. You're trained on all of that. Um, not only organs, but fluid collections like a pleural effusion um, in the body or uh, urine. Um, we look at all of that stuff. So I have a few examples here. Um, again, I'm not going to give you a big detailed lecture, but um, just, just to give you a taste of, of what kinds of things we see every day. I know it's not the best picture up here, um, but this is uh, a picture of normal bronchial cells and then a picture of lung cancer. Uh, I don't know how well you can see, but 
there's some pretty obvious nuclear differences. You've got these bright red spots here. Those are nuclei within the, the, the nucleus here. Um, so that's an indicator, can be an indicator of cancer. The nuclear enlargement. Another big thing we evaluate is the architecture of the cells. Um, here they're a lot more disorganized um, versus up here, especially this group here, you can see a nice glandular group with the eccentrically placed nucleus with terminal bar at top um, and some cilia. So in this really ugly, kind of poorly differentiated cancer here, there's no cilia, no terminal bar, um, no order to the cells. There's also a little bullet here. It's no surprise to anybody, lung cancer is linked to uh, smoking. Uh, it's, it's kind of a, a little time for me though to, to talk to you about my favorite part of cyto uh, cytotechnology, which is the fact that it's not a black and white field. There's no one feature that you can say, oh, there's nucleoli, it's malignant. Um, reactive things have nucleoli too. Um, so each cellular feature that you're looking at and evaluating is like a piece of a puzzle. And you take that with patient history, like are they smokers? Do they have a high risk anyway of malignancy? Um, other patient information, you put them all together, make the puzzle, get a big, you know, an over, over picture, get a big picture of things, and then you're able to come up with your differential diagnoses and make a correct diagnosis. So um, it's a process that we go through, and I love puzzles, so I knew this would be a good job for me. Um, but I like to use that analogy to kind of explain the thought processes that we go through. So just another example of cells. Um, these are um, bladder cells that have been shed into a urine specimen. And down at the bottom, we have actual bladder cancer um, from a urine specimen. Pretty obvious differences. You've got really irregular nuclear membranes here in the cell and some um, marked hyperchromasia here. Um, and again, with the architecture, normal bladder cells that are shed in urine are single cells versus you get these papillary structures with bladder cancer. And then my last example I have <coughs> for these are liver cells. And hopefully you can kind of start picking out the differences yourself. You've got some nuclear enlargement, um, differences in the chromatin. This stain here is a diff-quick stain. This is that quick stain I told you about that we do with the FNAs. And the previous stains, these kind of blue, these are PAP stains. And the next slide I have, we're gonna talk a little bit more about PAP stain. Um, you may have heard of a pap smear, which is the yearly screening test that, that women have done um, historically to screen for cervical cancer. Um, <clears throat> actually, at this point in time, guidelines have changed and it's not necessarily done every year and it's not a smear anymore. So, so the cells are not smeared onto the slide anymore. It's, it's done in a different manner, but we still all refer to it as the pap smear. Um, it's an important thing in cytotechnology. It's kind of one of the feathers in our cap, one of the more dramatic changes we brought to the medical field um, because <clears throat> since we've introduced that screening, uh, cervical cancer uh, deaths have dropped by over 70%. Um, gynecological samples are probably, it depends on what lab you go to. It can be anywhere from 50 to 100%. At Carl, it's probably um, 80 to 90% of my slide workload are gynecological slides. So it's a big portion of what we do. This is just a low power view of what that looks like. Um, you're looking mainly at squamous cells with some glandular cells. These are all squamous cells here. So this is a pap stain. Um, the pap stain stains uh, keratin a pink color. So these pink cells here are more superficial cells, uh, more mature versus these blue cells are intermediate cells. These little spots here are the neutrophils. So we look at these a lot, this is what we're looking at. This is what we're looking for. This group here is an example of low-grade dysplasia. So low-grade dysplasia, dysplasia is not a malignant condition. It is a pre-malignant condition. It is something that can, has the potential to turn into a malignancy. So this is what the screening does. Um, we can identify these kind of pre-malignant things so the clinician knows then to watch it or how to treat it. Um, this is related to HPV, HPV, human papillomavirus, it's gotten a lot of media in the last few years. They've just come out with the vaccine for it. Um, it is super, super common in men and women, especially in um, their 20s and 30s. So we see a lot of low grades. We see a lot of this. Um, and this is why we have so many, not, uh, so many gynecological samples. All right, so now that you know what it is that we do, 
how would you get into the field? Um, there's only one school for Cytotech in Illinois, that's at Carl. And we are actually a satellite program for the University of Nebraska, uh, their medical center there. They have a CYTO program there, and then we're a branch of that. Um, the way it works is the didactic portion, so your lectures and things, are done through UNMC. We have webcams and they do webcasts and teleconferencing. So you're interacting with their staff there um, as well as the students there. And then your hands-on learning is done here at Carl with our staff. Um, so your scope work and things, we teach you at the scope. Um, so it's, it's been a model that we've been using now for 10 years and it's been very successful. It's pretty, it's pretty unique. There's not a ton of distance sites out there, um, but we found it to be very effective. So what exactly is it? There's always some confusion on, is it a master's degree? It's not a master's degree. It's actually what's called a post-baccalaureate uh, certification. The certification comes through the University of Nebraska's medical school. Um, once you have received that certification, you're eligible to then take your um, na national exams, what we call your boards. And um, <clears throat> that's done through the American Society of Clinical Pathologists. And at that point, if you pass your boards, you're eligible to practice as a cytotech in almost all of the states. There are a few states that require an additional state exam, so you'd have to research that. Um, when you're actually in the program, what is it you're doing? Um, of course, you're learning the cytology of all those body sites that I mentioned, um, then that takes up a lot of your time. Um, but we also have um, courses in basic pathology, um, you're learning things about anatomy, physiology. You learn a little bit about histology, which is stuff at a tissue level versus cellular level. Um, <clears throat> so that's done pretty much the first half of the year. The second half of the year is that clinic clinical that I talked about, um, where you'll be actually doing things that, that we do. Um, you'll go on those FNAs. Uh, initially, you'll observe, and then eventually you'll perform them. You'll be under supervision, but you'll actually make the smears, evaluate the specimen under the scope, and interact <coughs> Excuse me, interact with the proceduralist. So it's really exciting. It's fun. I was a student. I, went, I was a student four years ago. I went through this program, and it was a lot of fun. And, um, it was just really great. Um, especially exciting because you're screening actual cases. The cases that come to our lab go to our students first. They they screen them, and then we as Cytotech screen them. So it's a lot of fun. Um, the program is a whole year long. It's one year, August to August, with 32 semester hours. This picture is our multi-head scope. So this is the instructor here, <clears throat> and she's got her slide here on the stage. And so she moves the slide around and can explain you know, what she's seeing in the cellular features to uh, all the students that sit around here. So it's very effective at teaching um, morphology and things. This is our cozy little student room here. We have spots for three students. Um, a lot of times we end up only taking two though, or so occasionally we've only taken one. So this is just a picture of our little students screening away. Um, <clears throat> all right, so admission requirements, you have to have that bachelor's degree. Within that, you need 20 semesters of a biology. Um, these are like recommended classes, but none of these are specifically required. Um, <clears throat> eight hours of chemistry, three hours of math. Cumulative GPA as well as science and math GPA of 2.5. Um, you'll do your letters of reference. Um, the online application process goes through UNMC. So in your flyer packet here, um, there's step-by-step -step instructions on how to do that. Um, and then that includes the information about your references. After you got all that in, we would um, call you and schedule a time with you to do um, an actual interview with our staff at Carl. All right, so just want to touch real quick on once you are a cytotechnologist, what kind of opportunities are there? Um, most of our students have, have gone into lab work for hospitals or private labs, what we call bench techs, which is what I am. Um, we have had a few students that have used cytology to kind of springboard into um, further education like med school or pathology assistant school. So that's an option too. Um, beyond that, uh, once you've been a cytotech for three years, you're eligible to be a senior cytotech and you can move into management. Um, and so there's, there's other things you can do like um, those automated machines I mentioned. Um, the sales reps for those are often cytotechs. So <clears throat> And that's a route that you can take as well. And as far as the demand in the workforce goes, um, there's a lot of changes going on right now um, with healthcare, with those guidelines I mentioned changing. Um, so there's kind of a flux right now. 
Um, but I just checked the other day, there are a ton of jobs out there. There's still a high demand for uh, slider technologists. But I will put the caveat in there that if you're looking to work in a specific city or a specific area, you may have trouble finding a job at any one point in time. We tell all our prospective students that if you think you're going to go <clears throat> to school at Carl and then get a job in the area, you may have a long wait. There just may not be an opening for you. Um, but if you're willing to move across, you know, wherever the jobs are, there are jobs out there. Um, we have placed all of our students in jobs. Like <clears throat> every student who has um, graduated and been willing to move has found a job. So demand, there is demand. Uh, in summary, basically this is just a really reward, rewarding career. Uh, you're literally helping save lives. You're helping um, make the diagnosis that then allows the clinician to treat appropriately you know, the problem with the patient and help that patient get better. Um, and not only that, but it's just a fascinating job. It, um, it's constantly challenging. It's constantly having you use your knowledge and skills in new and interesting ways. Um, and so it's just, it's really fun. In addition to that even, it's a one-year program. So, you know, you graduate, you do a year um, for your certif certification, and then you're ready for your career. So that's kind of a bonus too. Um, you get to wear scrubs every day. Better than a business suit, right? <laughs> so um, I really love my job. Hopefully maybe you guys feel like this could be a fit for you.